Good morning to you all. Welcome. Thank you for coming. And over the next couple of hours, I would like to speak to you about multi-threading. This, this talk is titled, Multi-Threading is the Answer. What is the question? Because a lot of times when I see programmers who are new to multi-threading or maybe have used it for a while but never really thought about how it's implemented and how you should work with it, I see things that simply indicate a, a misunderstanding of the fundamental question multi-threading is trying to solve. And apparently my clicker is having fun with me today. So I'm going to cover in this first part of the talk what multi-threading is, a lot of terminology that's required because I believe that definitions are crucially important in understanding language features and behaviors. And then I'm going to talk about some of the problems that multi-threading can be used to solve well. I'll talk about when multi-threading is the right way to solve a problem and also with an eye towards how you do a code review of multi-threaded code and look at it in, and in a code review environment and see things that might be out of place. So first of all, a quick question for the room. How many here have written a non-trivial multi-threaded program? Okay, quite a few of you, excellent. How many of you have done this using the C++ standard library threading features? Not as many, okay. Good, well this will also cover an introduction to some of the C++ standard library features. A lot of these were in C++ 11 and then they've been getting refined as the days go by. The real reason that this talk exists is because I've gotten some questions from people over time and the best phrased one was, I've read the C++ standard, I've read the section on multi-threading. Now, how do I use these classes, objects, methods, behaviors in a sentence? I've seen all the various pieces that are available, but I don't know how to put them together into a cohesive program that solves a problem. And one of the problems that happens when you start working with multi-threading is related to a very old problem in baking, which is a passion of mine and Barbara's. And thanks, thanks to her for helping me prepare most of the slides for this talk, because if these were my slides, they would not make nearly as much sense. <laughs> the problem with the Toll House Classic Chocolate Chip Cookie recipe is that the person who originally developed the recipe was from the Northeast, from the New England area. And nobody else in the rest of the country uses New England flour. And the problem is there are so many kinds of flour to choose from. And the original recipe just said flour. There was an assumption in that recipe. There was an assumption that you knew what kind of flour was in that person's pantry and available to hand. Which means if you try to make this recipe using whatever flour is available in your pantry, it won't come out the same. And I'll be talking about assumptions quite a bit. There's a third thing that comes up quite often when people start working with multi-threaded code. And I call this the just slap a lock on it and call it done theory, where by adding enough locks and mutexes to all of your various data structures, you end up with a program that has no obvious bugs. <laughs> and when you stop being able to find bugs, you're done. This is unfortunately not the best way to approach a complex multi-threading problem. <coughs> ah, yes, the, the comment from the audience was uh, putting enough volatiles in it until it works is also a, a really good plan for completely unmaintainable, undocumented behavior. So what usually happens when somebody is first exposed to multi-threading is there's some programmer, we'll name him Bob, he's a very very qualified C++ programmer. Say he knows C++ 17, he's up on the technical specifications, but he's never worked with a multi-threaded piece of code before. And he has some new problem and he thinks, I know, multi-threading is the way I'm going to solve this problem efficiently. Unfortunately, Bob now has a lot of issues to solve. At least one race condition, a couple of memory leaks, some use after free errors, and I guarantee you at least one runtime crash that will not be found until after the QA cycle. Don't ask me how I know this. 
So the first thing is, if you want to learn multi-threading properly, you have to find a problem for which multi-threading is the best answer. Don't take your current problem and assume that the right way to solve it is by using multiple threads. This is critically important, and this is a problem that I see even in a great number of tutorials about multi-threading. They will take some algorithm, say a sort algorithm, and write it as a multi-threaded algorithm. Quite often, the performance is no better. This is not helpful. Really ensure that your problem is one that's, that is solved well with multi-threading. So what actually is multi-threading? Well, it's important to have a rigorous definition of the terms that we're using so that we can talk about them clearly. Multi-threading is what you have when a program can execute multiple instructions at the same time. That's really fundamental. There's multiple things going on at the same time concurrently. And there are several equivalent definitions to this. One of the most important is the fact that multi-threading is sometimes a form of concurrency, sometimes it's a form of parallelism. Those are other terms that I won't define rigidly in this talk, particularly because the definitions of these are not as precise, and nobody agrees exactly on what they mean. I'll contrast multi-threading with multitasking, which is the ability of a program to do multiple things concurrently not necessarily at the same time. You can have a multitasking program that does one task after another in a sort of a time-sliced fashion, and it will get all of them done eventually, but it's not multi-threaded. And it's very important to keep in mind the distinction between these, particularly because on a single processor system, all you have is multitasking. There is no true multi-threading. There are several myths that I've discovered along the way to learning about multi-threading. And the most pervasive one that I'd like to address is that writing a multi-threaded program always makes it faster. And this is completely and absolutely not true. There are many cases for which the single-threaded solution is the right one and is faster. Amazingly, a lot of people think multi-threading makes programs more stable because there's a belief that the threads are in some sense independent enough that a failure in one thread won't affect the proper functioning of another thread. And those of you who raised your hand earlier will know this is not true. Now, another one which comes up, nobody really states this explicitly, but it's a very common misconception that a sufficiently smart programmer can write a multi-threaded program that is bug-free in the same way they write other programs which are bug-free. And this really breaks down because of the number of assumptions that occur in a multi-threaded program about the behavior of the process that you're working with and the other threads in that process. And there are two completely opposite myths that you run into as well. Multi-threading is hard. Well, multi-threading is not necessarily hard. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Multi-threading is also not necessarily easy. This depends critically on the problem you're trying to solve. So don't simply look at a problem and say, oh, multi-threading is the answer, and it's going to be hard, but I'm a really smart programmer, therefore I will be able to solve this problem well. Now, a thread, which I've been talking about but didn't define, is a, unit, a, a collection of work. It's a statement of a bunch of instructions to be performed on one core. And I'll define core in a moment. A thread is part of a process. Each thread has its own call stack, and that's the defining characteristic of a thread, is that it has a separate call stack from every other thread in your process. The process is the whole program as a unit. And most of you will be familiar with processes starting other processes from working with things like make. That obviously when make is invoked, it starts clang to compile one of your object files as a separate process. And this makes sense because processes don't share most resources. You don't want 
any of the code inside Clang to be modifying the data structures inside Make. They don't need to communicate in that way. But in threading, we do have a lot of communication between the different threads. Now the number of cores is a property of the system that you're running on. And what it really means is the total number of instructions that can be being executed at the same time. And this can be broken down into multiple processors, multiple packages. It's not really important for the purposes of understanding multi-threading. It, it gets a little more esoteric. While a thread is active, it is using an entire core. While a thread is sleeping, it is not using any cores. More cores doesn't always mean your program will run faster, particularly depending upon how you have implemented the solution to your hopefully straightforward multi-threaded problem. And in some environments, cores are not equal. And terms that come up in this area include hyper-threading, where cores can be siblings of one another, or NUMA, which is a non-uniform memory architecture where a certain core might be farther from one piece of memory than another core. Um, the other thing that's becoming more common in the mobile world is AMP, asymmetric multiprocessing where you might have a processor with eight cores and four of them are very fast and four of them are not. And you have the four that are not particularly fast running when you need low power consumption and the other cores only get, in, only get started when you need to do a lot of processing. This is not addressed as straightforwardly in the C++ threading library. Um, so that's, that's all I'm gonna say about that one. In a practical sense, Barbara and I have a CI machine that runs a lot of our continuous integration tests, and it has a six core CPU. And we looked at it and said, well, should we get the next more expensive CPU that has eight cores? And the answer is no, because the eight core CPU has a slower clock speed. So each one of those cores can do less work in the same amount of time. And if you look at the cost of the eight core CPU, versus the six core CPU, you realize that you're paying an e enormous premium for what is actually a very small improvement in speed. You would expect it to be you know, one third faster than the six core CPU, but it turns out not to be the case. So you really wanna understand the underlying behavior of the hardware that you're on to get an idea of how its performance will be with various solutions. Another term that we need to define is a resource. And there are many resources in a running program. Any particular memory location you can think of as a resource. A file handle is a, another example of them. Or really any object that you are working with in your program that isn't specifically designed to be thread safe. And the important thing about a resource, its defining characteristic, is that you must not access a resource from multiple threads simultaneously. There are sometimes exceptions to this, but by and large, this is the case and this is the rule that you have to follow when you're writing a multi-threaded program. And if you have a bug, it is because you violated this rule. Any questions on these definitions as we've gone over so far? Intimately tied with the concept of a resource is a race condition. And the C++ standard has a long and slightly more complex definition of a race condition because they don't have a definition of resource. But under the definition of resource I'm using, this is the correct definition of a race condition. And the important thing about race conditions is that in the C++ standard, they invoke undefined behavior. If you have a read and a write to the same memory location at the same time, your program has undefined behavior. The problem with this kind of undefined behavior, as opposed to many other places where your program may have undefined behavior, the effect of the undefined behavior in this case is almost always that your program did what you thought it should, which is really problematic because it's very difficult to test a multi-threaded program for correctness because of this behavior. As I mentioned, the stack is the area that is unique to a thread as opposed to the heap, which is shared by all threads. So the heap is a resource. 
Now, fortunately, in C++, most of the methods which work directly with the heap are thread safe. So you don't have to worry about this as much just in terms of allocating and deallocating memory. However, you do have to be aware that if you have a stack local object, it probably is not visible to other threads. If you have an object on the heap, it usually is. So you need to be more cautious about heap objects to avoid race conditions. There's another concept which is somewhat related to threads, and that's fibers. And they're in some sense related to coroutines, sort of. They're not scheduled by the OS. They're not actually something that the operating system knows anything about. So you sometimes have to make calls to explicitly start and stop a fiber, sometimes called cooperative multi-threading. And I'm not an expert in this space, but I know that Nat is giving a talk about it tomorrow. So if you want to learn more about fibers, I'm sure that'll be an excellent resource. Pardon? His comment is, which multiple people can access at the same time? And that's a good thing, because if we all had to watch the talk once, one at a time, that would be terrible for performance. Green threads are kind of related to fibers. And this is the term that you use when you have the concept of threads inside some sort of a virtual machine that's in control of thread scheduling. It's not something that exists in C++. It's not a concept that really makes sense in C++. But you'll see it a lot in older versions of Java, had green threads. And there's something sort of like this in Erlang and Go, because they have a threading model in those languages that makes sense in this environment. So let's talk a little bit about the problems that multi-threading can solve for you. When you want to solve a problem, this is what I look for, to say multi-threading is the answer to this question. You want a task that you can split into independent processing steps. You want each one of those steps to have a clear input and output so that you know your data flow through the system. You want something that does a lot of computation, because if your process is mostly doing I.O., threading is not necessarily going to help. One of the other things that you can look for is perhaps you have a large read-only data set that you want to query repeatedly. This is a great problem to solve using multiple threads. Or processing a stream of large data files is sometimes a good environment for multi-threading. Again, that's a case where your task can be usually split into independent steps. You have a lot of different data files. And each one can be treated as a unit on its own. These are the problems you like to have in a multi-threaded solution. There's another kind of problem. These are the problems for which you have to use multi-threading even though it's difficult and it's not a good solution. And these are the problems which are challenging. And the main thing that you have to look out for is tasks who, whose performance does not work as a single-threaded application. If, you're, if you cannot meet your performance targets with a single thread, you have to solve the problem using multiple threads. And you could consider multiple processes, though. You could, that is true. You could potentially consider multiple processes. That can sometimes be a solution. Um, it's often very awkward later on in the architecture process, however, because you'll discover that you didn't define the interfaces between your processes richly enough. And you end up having a lot of internal APIs and a lot of friction there. But it, that multiple processes can sometimes be a solution to this problem. However, suppose that the performance, which is unacceptable in a single thread, is the problem of writing an operating system. Non-multi-threaded operating systems are not popular anymore. <laughs> Their performance is simply unacceptable. Another case where you often have issues is when the workload can't be anticipated. If you can look at the problem and say, okay, I can break this down into n units and I can send each unit to one thread, that's great. 
But if you have requests coming in from the outside world in an unpredictable order, in a random fashion, it's much more challenging to structure your architecture so that responsibilities are clearly defined. The other behavior that you should look for in a problem is when you have multiple resources, and operating systems are a great example of this, database systems are a great example of this, it's very challenging to get the performance you need in, say, a modern database without having multiple threads accessing the underlying database simultaneously. There are resources there which are shared between all those threads and they must be protected. You can't allow outside clients to access the same resource simultaneously. So these are the problems you look for and you say, darn, I have one of these. I need to use multi-threading. I need to manage the complexity of this system as well as I can so that I come up with a solution that actually works. I had a real life example of this in my professional career. I was given a streaming video server. I was given a prototype of it that unfortunately had been put in production. I know this never happens where any of you work. And its performance didn't, didn't meet the requirements at all. And the goal was, let's make the production code as fast as possible. So I looked at it. I immediately assumed this needs to be a multi-threaded application. Server application serving multiple clients. I've got resources. I've got video information coming in and needing to be delivered. And this will be the answer. But I decided to benchmark first. And I decided to see what the performance of a single threaded version of this application would be. I knew that the future might be that this needed to be multi-threaded. So I left enough hooks in in the architecture that we could add multiple threads at a later date if it became necessary. But the bottleneck was actually in the network card. And it turned out that on one core, I could very easily saturate the entire networking system of this hardware. So there's really no reason to add the complexity of multi-threading. The right answer was optimize the poorly designed prototype, not turn it into a multi-threaded, poorly optimized system. So that's very important to ask yourself, do I really need threads to solve this problem? Because the answer is often surprisingly no. As an aside, the single threaded version of this system used about half a core to saturate the network card. At a certain point, I was asked to benchmark a multi-threaded version of it to see if we could improve the performance. And it turned out that the multi-threaded version took four cores to saturate the network system because of the overhead involved in passing data around. So there's an example where the multi-threaded system is actually far less efficient. It uses less uh, the, the single threaded version uses fewer resources, leaves more of the machine for the rest of your processing. So when you're looking at a multi-threaded problem, the first thing I ask is, what's my scale? Well, you need a different kind of ice cream maker depending upon how many people you're serving. If you're running an ice cream shop, you're going to need a large one, but that wouldn't be practical for home use. In the same vein, the things I'm going to be talking about here apply to a particular subset of multi-threading solutions. I'm talking about the typical desktop or server applications for some single or double digit number of cores written in C++ 11 or later. This covers a lot of the universe, a lot of mobile devices, desktop servers. What this doesn't cover is the 10 to 100,000 core scientific computing situation. That's a completely different ballgame and you need to apply different techniques. Any questions on anything that's come up so far? As, as we go through, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. So let's look at a very simple problem to solve. Let's say we're running a restaurant and we have a kitchen and we have an order that came in for 50 fruit salads. And each one of our chefs has their own knife. There's plenty of fruit, there's plenty of bowls. So let's make some fruit salads. 
One of the reasons why I really like C++11 as an environment for writing multi-threaded code is that it actually fits on a slide. <laughs> Unlike some other libraries you may have used in the past. We create a thread object. We can pass to that thread object a lambda that says exactly what we want to occur in that thread. And create another thread object and then we're going to call join on each of these threads and the purpose of the join is to wait until that chef has finished their work. So each chef has a nice little simple for loop 25 times we make a fruit salad. Any problems with this? Could this be any more efficient? Is there any way to speed this up? You don't know much about make fruit salad. That's a good point. Um, for the moment, let's assume it's a computation that does a lot of work and produces no output. I'll, I'll address that question a little more later on, but that's an excellent comment. Um, so assuming that make fruit salad is just some long running numerical computation, is there anything I can do to get these salads made faster? Excellent point. I'm assuming I have multiple cores. How many cores am I assuming I have here? At least two. That's a really good answer. I'll talk more about that later. You're also assuming that, that thread one and two actually get scheduled concurrently. You could end up uh, thread one being done, still scheduled. Thread two still waiting to be scheduled. Thread one might That's a really good point. So I'm assuming that both of these threads, both of these chefs are working at the same time. They might not be, depending upon what the operating system decides to do and what order they run in. And they may not be working at the same speed. That's a good point. So we can see that even in this, which is pretty much the simplest multi-threaded code that you could possibly have, there are a lot of assumptions and there are a lot of external factors that go into deciding what your performance will be, um, how these will be scheduled, what order things will be done in. We've already got a lot of complexity and this is a small enough section of code to fit on a slide in 16 point font. So let's talk about a slightly more complex example. Let's deal with the problem of making a bunch of apple pies. We've got a large order from some company for 50 of them. And the difference is we're now going to have an oven, which is a shared resource. You can't put two pies in the oven at the same time. That's just the rules as we've defined them. So what does the solution to this problem look like? Well, now we get to start bringing in a lot of additional complexity. I'm going to declare an oven. I like good ovens, so this is a Viking. And I have a mutex, which is going to protect my access to that oven and prevent multiple threads from accessing it simultaneously. Then I'm going to create my chef. And I need my chef to have access to these shared resources. So I'm going to capture these pieces of data so that they can be used inside the lambda. And then 25 times, I'm going to create a pie object, make a crust, put some apples in. Then I'm going to lock this mutex and bake the pie for a certain amount of time. And then Chef 2 does exactly the same thing. How quickly will this get done? That's a really good point. So if baking the pie takes a lot longer than making the crust and putting the apples in, then the performance is going to be terrible. There is no solution about making it really better because you can make it better just about uh, those percentage that uh, takes preparing the pie. I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. 
you still need uh, can uh, bake uh, just one pie at once. So it will take baking 50 pies plus baking those 50 pies and it's, it's 1% of time. Very good point. Make it 1% faster, no more. Very good point. So if, if baking a pie takes a second, say, there is absolutely no way this code can finish in less than 50 seconds because we need that much time spent with this shared resource. So again, a lot of concerns that come up in this little bit of code. Yes? That's a really good point as well. So I'm assuming here that the right answer is to have the chef stand in front of the oven and wait for the pie to be finished before they go on and do anything else. That's another point. There was another question over here. Would it make sense to split it up, making and baking, into two or three different threads? Would it make sense to split it up into two or three different threads between the making and the baking? That's a really good idea. Hold that question for a moment. So a lot of the complexity of this code comes from the fact that we're working with this oven. We're having both chefs do the same thing. What if we turn this around? What if we have one chef make the pies and the other chef put them in the oven? And we have the same amount of resources. I'm not changing the number of ovens that we have. If we could get another couple of ovens, we could maybe speed this up. But with one oven, we have to manage access to that oven somehow. True? Not necessarily, because one of the best features of C++11 that's been added is the ability to give something away. So I'm now going to have an oven, and I'm going to have a queue, a, a conveyor belt, that one chef can put things on and the other chef can take them off. I'm not going to cover the implementation of a thread safe queue here. You can use your favorite search engine and you will find several dozen, most of which will be correct. And I know there are a few implementations in Boost of which I'm certain they're correct. So our first chef now only needs access to the conveyor belt. And they can make a pie. They can make the crust, put the apples in. And then they can move the pie onto the conveyor belt. And since I've said this is a thread safe queue, this queue function can be called concurrently with any other number of actions simultaneously that are being done on the queue. Another way to look at this is, according to the definitions I used at the beginning of the talk, this conveyor belt is not a resource. Because remember, a resource is something which must be protected from being accessed at the same time by multiple threads. So this is no longer a resource. It's something else. It's a thread safe object. So now, the other chef does something completely different. They stand there at the conveyor belt, waiting for a pie to come off. And as soon as a pie comes off, they put it in the oven. As soon as it comes out of the oven, they grab another pie. Notice what isn't here in this example. There's no mutex. You're correct. Is there a lock? Implicit in your thread safe queue. Implicit in the thread safe queue. There, is, there may be a lock. It may be a lockless queue. But regardless, there's not a lot of work being done in queue and DQ. So you won't, you won't spend a lot of time here, even if there is a lock internally in the implementation of this method. Because um, it's doing a very small operation. Or we hope that move is a small operation. That's the intent. So now we have the second chef baking pies. The question is, can we optimize this? Is this the right solution to our problem? Depends on how much time it takes to bake the pie versus how much time it takes to prepare it. That's part of an answer. The other question is, I'm making an assumption in my question. What is optimal? Exactly. 
what is the optimal solution that I'm going for? Because optimization doesn't just mean getting the answer faster, necessarily. The other question is, how much overhead is there in this solution? Well, we've traded a repeated lock and unlock of a mutex for moving information from one thread to another. That is usually faster, because locking and unlocking can be quite expensive. Here's another question. Can we have a deadlock in this code? Okay, that's a good point. If, if at some point the first chef cuts himself and throws an exception, then the second chef will be waiting forever for all 50 pies to come down the conveyor belt. That's absolutely true. And certainly this for loop is probably not the way you want to phrase this problem. You don't want to assume that all of the pies will be available on the conveyor belt. You'd want some sort of error handling. That's very true. But that's not exactly a deadlock condition, per se. A deadlock is when you have two threads waiting for the same resource, and neither of them can make progress because they're both waiting for the other. Do these threads ever wait for a resource? No, they don't. We don't even have a shared resource. This resource, the oven, is only accessed from thread two. So how many resources do we have in this example? Okay, so the, question, the comment was the main thread waits on the other two threads. That's true, but the main thread doesn't use any resources at all. So it can't have a deadlock because it's not waiting for access to any of the resources. It's just waiting for these chefs to be done and, and you know, clean up their workstation and go home. At some point, that will happen, assuming there's no infinite loop here, and I don't see a way that there could be one. But there's actually, if you count the number of resources, as I've defined it, in this problem, well, here's one, the Viking oven. That's definitely important. There's a conveyor belt, but that's not a resource, so you don't have to count it in the set of resources you have to worry about in terms of race conditions. But we also have 50 pies. These are objects, they're not thread safe, therefore they're resources. So we have 51 resources in this program. But there's a really important property about the way they're used. This oven is only used from the second chef. So there's no way we can have any sort of a deadlock or race condition there. The pies are always in one of three states. They're either being made by the first chef sitting on the conveyor belt, or being baked by the second chef. Which means there cannot be a race condition in this code. It is categorically impossible for this code to have a race condition. And since there are no locks, there is no possibility for a deadlock. This is what I like to see in a code review. This code is easy to review, because I can check no locks, no mutexes, no deadlocks at all. No object ever belongs to more than one thread at a time. No race conditions. We're done. Code review over. You can check it in. Question. So thread two waits for thread one, right? I'm kind of thinking about that. Um, because thread two needs to wait for some pie to be ready. So DQ actually has some waiting conditions, right? That is correct. So the, the comment was that thread two is waiting for thread one. And that's correct. Assuming that the first baker can make pies faster than the second thread can bake them, then yes, this, uh, or, sorry. Or, yes, I, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. If the first sh uh, thread makes pies more slowly than the second thread can bake them, then the second chef will spend some time here waiting for the first chef to make a new pie available to bake. There is waiting. There may or may not be a lock, depending upon how it's implemented. But most importantly, we're not waiting on a resource. We don't have an explicit lock. 
So assuming DQ is written correctly, you can't have a deadlock. That's correct. It, it, that's exactly right. Sh uh, the second thread can starve, but not deadlock. Okay. What, if, what if chef one was also calling DQ? Then that would be a What if chef one was also calling DQ? Could there also be a, a deadlock? Not if thread safe Q is written correctly. Assuming that the documentation of thread safe Q says this is a multiple producer, multiple consumer Q then you should be able to have multiple chefs pulling off of the conveyor belt simultaneously without worrying about a deadlock. One of them might have to wait a while for a new element to show up in the queue, but there shouldn't be a deadlock. I think his concern is that if thread one is waiting on the, the uh, conveyor belt and thread two is also waiting on the conveyor belt, uh, nobody's making the Ah, I see what, you, okay. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, so, so the question was actually, if thread one is trying to take something off the conveyor belt and not making a pie, and thread two is trying to take something off the conveyor belt at the same time, nobody will ever end up making a pie, and they will both be stuck forever. That's true. That is a possible deadlock situation. So that's a good point. If, if thread one dequeued information from this thread safe queue, there is the possibility for deadlock. That's a good point. Thank you both for that clarification. So, but as written, there is absolutely no way for this code to have a deadlock. So, let's say we have a few more items that we need, and now we need to do two different kinds of things because we need fruit salad and chicken salad. And the problem is you have to clean up your work area between working on both of these because you really don't want chicken in your fruit salad. So the question is, which is the best way to implement this? Which one of these three options sounds like a better plan? We could have each chef make a fruit salad, clean up, and then make a chicken salad and do this 25 times. Or we could have one chef make all the fruit salads and have the other chef make, a chicken sal make all the chicken salads. Or we could have both chefs coordinate in some way and make fruit salad until there's enough of them and then switch over to making chicken salads. Which one of these sounds like the best option? So Okay. Mm -hmm. That's true. So in some sense, this third option is best, where both chefs start making one type of salad and then switch over to making the other once enough have been made. But is this as simple to implement? There needs to be coordination between the threads. So if this is a small part of my program, and I don't care about efficiency here, is that the best solution? That's a very good point. So he's saying dynamic load balancing and the bookkeeping that's required for this solution adds some overhead. So if a fruit salad and a chicken salad take the same amount of time to make, this is not a bad solution because both chefs will get done around the same time and you won't have had to spend any time checking whether you should switch over yet. So sometimes this is the best solution. Maybe this is a small part of my problem, and this is easier to code and simpler to reason about, and I'm not really concerned about the performance, so this is a solution. Or quite possibly there's a fourth solution. Don't even bother using threads because I have lots of other stuff to do, and this is not an important part of the runtime of my program. So the answer to what's the best way to solve this problem in a multi-threaded fashion is always it depends. What are your assumptions? 
What are you trying to optimize for? Programmer time, maintainability, readability, the amount of runtime, the amount of time it takes to complete the task, how many CPU cycles you use while completing these tasks. Those are all different variables, and they all have different best solutions. Does that make sense? So now let's try a real restaurant. It's a small real restaurant because we only have a few dishes, but we don't have any particular ordering to anything. People can show up at the counter and order at any point. What's the solution to this? Well, pandemonium is good. Another term that was in here originally in the slide deck is tangled mess. This is the kind of problem where you say, darn, is multi-threading really the solution to this problem? Isn't there some other way? Well, in this case, there isn't. I need more food coming out the door than I can have one chef make. My customers will be unhappy if I'm that slow. So I have to multi-thread this. I'm going to walk you through how to implement this using fairly modern C++ techniques. And then in the following talk, just after this one, I'll show you some other techniques that we can use to build on top of the tools that are available in C++ to make this problem a little more tractable. Okay, so the comment was, if you're, if you're spending a lot of time waiting for a resource and that's what's impacting your performance, you could potentially use that resource asynchronously, somehow defer that or not wait for that resource and go do something else while that resource is unavailable. And that sometimes works. But what if you don't physically have enough time for one chef to make pies and stir ice cream and all of the things that actually require interaction with the various parts of your program. There just isn't enough time for one human being to do all of these tasks. And it's not just waiting for the shared resource that's preventing me from reaching my performance targets. Then you have to use multiple threads or potentially multiple processes. But if I start two restaurants in two kitchens next door to each other and I have to move the oven from one kitchen to the other every time somebody needs a pie, that's gonna be a little awkward. This really is a situation where you want all the chefs in the same kitchen cooperating to make this happen. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, let's set up our resources. Any resource you can should be defined in a nice central location. And here are the three. I've got a great Viking oven, a nice brick oven, and an ice cream maker. These are all going to be needed for various foods. And then I'll declare my foods as just typical objects. The implementation of these isn't particularly important. And I'm going to define what it means to eat some food so that I know what happens when a patron got their food and was successfully served and they're happy and ready to pay the check. And now I'm going to use a patron ticket and a chef ticket. And the way I look at these is the patron ticket is the number that you go and put on your table to say, this is where I would like my food delivered when it's ready. And the chef ticket is the piece of information that says, here is what needs to be done in order to fill this order. And this is the combination that's represented in C++ as a future and a promise. This is the mechanism. This is the way I like to think about them in this fashion because it makes a lot of problems a little more clear particularly because future and promise are ambiguous names and it could be argued that they could be in the other order. So let's set up a patron. Each one is going to be a thread. And this thread wants some garlic knots, some pizza, and ice cream. And then it's going to wait until those orders are there on the table in front of this person and eat them. Make sense? This is reasonably straightforward code. Not that hard to read. This looks sequential. This is the order in which I want these things to happen. And here's another patron that just wants some ice cream and some apple pie. 
and they're going to eat those things as well. Any questions here? Is this hard code to read? If you were in a code review environment, would you have any trouble analyzing this code and looking at it and saying, that looks reasonable? Now I'm going to define an order, and again, I'm not going to go into the implementation details of that. Now I want some way to know when my chefs should go home. So I need a flag that says the restaurant's still open, and at some point, I'm going to set this flag to false, and the chefs will discover that and finish up, clean up their workspace, and go home. And the reason I'm using an atomic value here is because I don't want to have to worry about locking. And the nice property about atomic values is they are not resources. They do not need to be locked. They can be accessed by any number of threads in any order, and you will always get a consistent behavior. It may not be the same behavior every time. It's not deterministic. But you will get some sane behavior that makes sense. And I'm going to start my chefs. And all they're going to do is take an order off the order queue and do it until the restaurant closes. This is pretty simple. This is pretty straightforward. Any concern? Oh, yes. I can't really see how this press would lock if the rule would be automatically I'm sorry? I cannot understand how this press would lock if the variable restaurant open was not atomic. You are only reading the So far, so the question was, wouldn't this work even if restaurant open wasn't atomic? Well, so far I'm only reading the value. That's true, so I don't have a race condition. But at some point, somebody needs to set it to true to tell the chefs to go home. But if there is one uh, manager of the restaurant, he will be only, the only person who writes the value. Mm -hmm. But remember the rule of when you need to lock a resource. You need to lock a resource if there's concurrent access to it, and at least one of those accesses is a write. These chefs are reading from the value. Somebody else later is going to write to it. If this chef doesn't lock, assuming there, this was not atomic, assume this was just a bool. If this chef doesn't lock, you have a race condition whenever the manager later on sets this value to true. And I don't know that's not strictly true for most platforms because uh, the, a, a single write to an object ends up being an atomic operation. It doesn't matter if you read it and it was false. So the next time you go around the wild, it will be true. So the comment is, well, that doesn't matter on most platforms because a single operation is usually atomic. And so each time around the while loop, the compiler will see that it's it's true and test it. The problem is not the architecture. The problem is the C++ standard. The standard says simultaneous reading and writing from a non-atomic value is undefined behavior. And what kind of undefined behavior might you have? Well, let's look at it for a second. If restaurant open is not atomic, then the compiler is allowed to assume no other thread changed it. Because if some other thread changes it while you're reading it, you have undefined behavior. So the compiler can transform this code into the semantically equivalent code if restaurant is open, while true, do this. That's a perfectly legal optimization according to the standard, which means this thread will only read restaurant open once and no later changes will ever be seen. That's the kind of undefined behavior you can have if you have a race condition. It's not the architecture that gets you, it's the optimizer. Um, <laughs> so. um, would it change something if you declare the um, restaurant open as volatile? Would it change something if you declared restaurant open as volatile? <coughs> and the answer is no. It would, I believe, in C11 potentially. I'm not sure. However, in C++, the standard very explicitly says, although the compiler isn't allowed to reorder accesses to a volatile variable, you still have undefined behavior. Because now the standard is protecting you against 
architectures that do unusual things with memory accesses. You have to be safe both at the optimizer level and at the architecture level for this code to be correct. Volatile only protects you from the optimizer. It does not protect you from the underlying architecture. STD Atomic guarantees you are protected from race conditions in both. I'm concerned that if your restaurant is very unpopular, your threads never terminate. He's concerned that if my restaurant is very unpopular, my threads never terminate. That's absolutely true. That's another concern in this code. So what we're seeing is the fact that in a code review, there will often be really surprising problems found. Well, how do I get my chef to go home if there aren't any orders in the queue? I can't. So I need some way to either interrupt the DQ, which could be messy, or perhaps at the end of the day, I close the restaurant and then send in a final order to each one of my chefs to make something small, a little appetizer. And then after that, they'll go home. So here's another problem. Uh, yes, the person who walks in right before the restaurant closes is going to have some issues as well. I think, Jens, you had a comment? Oh, okay. Is there? Going back to the volatile and topic discussion, I think what, and I think it's useful to actually understand what is that the mean of memory barrier in order for one trade to see the changes that were made by another trade. That's, that's absolutely true, and the comment was you need um, what's called a memory barrier for one thread to see the changes that were made by another thread. And STD Atomic guarantees that reads and writes to this atomic value are protected by a memory barrier. And there's a lot of specifics on different memory barriers that you can specify. This simple form that I'm using where it looks like I'm just using the atomic value as a Boolean, this will generate a full memory barrier and you'll get the behavior that you would sort of intuitively expect from a value which was false at some point in the program and then at some, or, sorry, it started out true and then at some point in the execution of the program it became false. And all the threads will agree that it started out true and at some point from their point of view it became false. And everybody will roughly agree on when that transition from true to false happened. So we can see, again, a small amount of code, a lot of concerns. We have to look into the assumptions of, well, will there be a final order that comes through on the queue that lets the chef go home? Now, let's look at how we actually order a piece of food. So I'm going to declare the order pizza function. We dealt with that slightly earlier. And it's going to return a patron ticket because that's what the patron wants. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up a shared pointer to a chef ticket. And the reason this is a shared pointer I'll address in just a moment. And then the next thing we do is we attach that chef ticket to a patron ticket. And the way you do that is by first declaring the chef ticket and then calling get future on that. And that ties this chef and patron ticket together so that when the chef is finished with this dish, it will be delivered to the patron. Now I'm going to set up an order, and this class order takes a lambda, which it's going to wrap and put in the order queue. And what do I do? Well, what I want the chef to do when they get this order is make a pizza. So I'm going to include the instructions for making a pizza right here. I'm going to use a unique pointer to a pizza. Now, unique pointer is, I think, the best feature in the C++ threading library. It's not in the threading library, but it's the best feature in the threading library. Because unique pointer can guarantee me that this object that pizza points to can only be used by one entity at a time. It can only be in one place because unique pointer is not copyable. It's only movable. So immediately in my code review, I'm looking at this and going, okay, this pizza is very difficult to generate a race condition on because it's very difficult to have multiple references to it simultaneously. So I like this. I've got a pizza. I'm going to add some sauce and some cheese. I'm going to, uh, yes? Now, it's, it's nice that you have a pizza, but how can you reassign pizza from the oven layer? So you can move the 
Um, Any particular reason you prefer a unique pointer over a copy of pizza? Any reason you prefer a pointer, a unique pointer over a copy of a pizza object? That's a good point. And if I don't mind making a copy, then that makes a lot of sense. In this case, I don't really want copies of the pizza. That's not really helpful in this particular context. If you're OK with your resource being replicated, then a copy is quite all right. But then you have to think about questions of, is some thread going to modify its local copy? And some other thread, of course, won't see those changes well, because Excellent question. And the, the comment was, aren't you making a unique pizza for each thread? I'm not. I'm making a unique pizza for every order. There may be many, many orders. And an order needs to be fulfilled by some chef. And then the pizza that they made needs to be given to the patron. Those are two different threads that can participate in this process many times. So I have object being created in one area and consumed in another. Um, so in this particular case, the unique pointer makes more sense. Ah, so why do we dynamically allocate rather than static <coughs> allocating it on the stack and moving? Um, and that's certainly also an option. Um, depending upon the size of pizza, that may not be a good idea. So I just wanted to show the more general case that if this were a stack local object, I would also be very happy with the fact that it's local because I know that it's not going to be referenced for multiple places at a time. My point in showing this is to say a unique pointer to an object is just as safe as a stack local object from a multi-threading mindset. That's a very good point. It's safer because you can't accidentally copy it. Even if pizza is copyable, I know that I'm not going to copy this pizza. <coughs> or I would have to work a good bit harder at doing it. I'd need another make unique that accepted this pizza and made a copy. So that's a very good point. So now I've got this pizza. I've got it all ready for the oven. I'm going to lock the brick oven mutex I'm going to bake the pizza. And this is a form that I find works very nicely in a lot of cases with unique pointer. And it also helps me reason about the code. Because I could have declared brick oven dot bake to take a reference to a pizza, an L value reference. And then I could have just dereferenced pizza and passed it to the brick oven, and it would have modified my pizza. It would have baked my pizza, and, and my, the pizza that I am holding on to suddenly becomes hot. I find it easier to reason about unique pointers when I use this form. I am taking this pizza, I am giving it to the oven, and the oven is returning me a pizza which is now hot. I can look at this line and say, I understand that the ownership of this pizza is passing from this chef into the oven. Now the oven may internally be implemented using a separate thread because I have given away my pizza to the oven. This now gives me more flexibility inside the implementation of bake to then transfer ownership of the pizza to some other object or potentially a different thread. At some point, it will come back to me, and it will be hot, and it will be baked. And I don't care how many hands it went through along this path. And then I have this chef ticket. I'm finally done with the pizza. It's ready. It's hot. And I put this pizza in the chef ticket by setting its value. And again, I'm giving away my pizza. I don't need it anymore. I'm not going to eat it. I want to get it to the patron, so I will move it away. So does this seem like it would solve the problem? Question? It can wait forever to get the brick oven. It could wait forever to get the brick oven. Interesting. Is that, how would, 
what causes a multi-threaded a thread in a multi-threaded program to wait forever? So there, there could be multiple threads trying to use the oven at the same time. But as long as there's no deadlock, this thread will eventually get the oven. You can't predict when. But as long as none of the threads stops holding the lock to the oven, you will eventually get through this code. It may not be as fast as you want, but you will finish. Another thing that I'd like to note about this function is this function returns immediately. This constructor does not execute the baking of the pizza. So this function returns immediately, but it has a side effect that occurs later. And that's the, the general form that you work with when you're dealing with chef and patron tickets, futures and promises, is you have a function that sets up some process to be executed later. This function returns immediately. You get immediate access to some placeholder for the value that will be computed later. And this is a very general technique and a pattern that's important to see and understand. There's actually two different sets of code here. There's the outer set, which runs immediately, and there's the inner set, which is deferred. Any questions on that? Now, if you're in C++14, as I hope most of us are at this point, we can change this. Remember that I said the chef ticket was a shared pointer. Well, the reason the chef ticket is a shared pointer is because I need to capture it into the lambda. And in C++11, you can't capture by move. So in C++14, we can get rid of the fact that this is a shared pointer. And we can just move capture the chef ticket, which is a movable but non-copyable type. So just a little refinement there that prevents a heap allocation when possible. So some things to consider about this example. It's obviously a simplified example to fit on a slide deck. Some things that you would want to do if you were doing this in the real world. You would not want to use a single queue. In most cases, you want one queue per thread because it's more efficient that way for various cache reasons that I won't go into too, in too much detail. Then if that thread notices that its queue is empty, you don't want it sitting there waiting for something to show up. You want it to do the slightly less efficient but still useful task of going and trying to steal work from another thread. Work stealing is a very important property to look for in a worker thread pool scheduling system. Now, a very good point was raised over here a little while ago. A chef shouldn't be waiting for a pizza to bake because this is wasting a very expensive resource, a thread, waiting for the pizza. And the other thing is that this locking is kind of abstruse and arbitrary because this code in here, every line of this code pertains to making a pizza, except this one. We have a word for this in English. We call this a non sequitur. It doesn't have anything to do with the surrounding code. And I'll cover that in much more detail in the second half of this talk. But there should be a better way. Is this lock held longer than necessary? Excellent question. That's a very good point. This lock only is required to bake the pizza. I don't need it to do this set value. So I should be either putting curly braces around these two lines, which is not exactly the prettiest way to do it, or I should have an unlock here but then I need to get into the details of the threading library because lock guard can't be unlocked. So I need to use a more heavyweight lock object called unique lock, which has an unlock method. Now I have three lines of code that don't pertain to what I'm actually doing, but it's an excellent point. Um, if, if, if you do that and if you use unlock, you have a problem with big open uh, frozen exception. If I use if, if you use unlock, then you have a problem with if brick oven throws an exception. Um, but you're still using the lock guard for the, uh, sorry, the unique lock, and so it will release when you leave. 
Yeah, I believe that's true. If, if you use unique lock, then it will release no matter how you leave the scope of that unique lock. If you do a, an explicit lock on the mutex, that would be a problem. Never ever do that. But if you use unique lock, then you absolutely, um, it will be exception safe. So we can see that there's a lot of complication here to consider. So as I wrap up this half of the talk, I'm gonna give you some miscellaneous threading advice. Try to avoid having too many active threads at one time. You really wanna have one per core, ideally. This is the best performance you can have in a system is when you have one active thread per core and they're all busy all the time. That's your best possible performance situation. The way you do this is by moving any blocking calls that you have, any disk IO, any network IO, any request to external systems to another set of threads that can block without making your core running working threads wait. The other problem that is very common in multi-threaded code, especially people who are new to it, is overuse of shared data. The most important thing you can do when designing a multi-threaded system is to reduce the amount of data that has to be shared. And once you've reduced the amount of, the number of shared data structures to the absolute minimum, then try to make them smaller because the less data is in each shared resource, the less often it will have to be locked, the less difficult it is to reason about the behavior of that resource. This is the design principle for multi-threaded code, reduction of shared data. It will yield you performance benefits, it will yield you maintainability benefits, you'll get readability benefits out of it. It's so much easier to reason about the code that's smaller. Question? That's a very good point. The, the larger number of shared resources you have, the more possibilities you have for deadlock in your code. And that's excellent advice because the number of possible deadlocks grows exponentially in the number of shared resources that you have to work with. And if you must have a large amount of shared data, do anything you can to make it read only because read-only shared data doesn't cause deadlocks. Question? I would say that many times, many people when they try to read more press than uh, core, hardware cores, uh, because still you are taking some time, for example, from the read-from memory, and then you give uh, the CPU scheduler the ability to swap press who are waiting, even if you are, even if you are not sure that you, they are waiting for some resource, they could be still waiting. It, it so, So the comment was, it's sometimes beneficial to have more active threads than CPU cores because a particular thread might be waiting on memory. That can happen in some environments where you have memory access patterns that cause a lot of page faults. It's rare for that to be a win in most operating systems because a page fault is so expensive that you lose the performance of context switching away to another task in any case. Sometimes it's useful, um, but in general as a model, I, I would say at the very least, your number of active threads should be linear in the number of cores. You might have a situation where you find that two running threads per core works well for you, but you don't just want n threads to solve a problem of size n. That is never the right answer. Does that make sense? And as I said, since a race condition implies a right to shared data, if you have no shared data that is writable, you don't have a race condition. So read-only data gives you two really nice properties. You don't have to worry about race conditions and you don't have to worry about deadlocks. I like this. Make everything you possibly can read-only, even if it means you have to do some extra computation in some threads sometimes. It still will usually be a win. Benchmark it, you'll be surprised. And that wraps up the first half of this introduction to multi-threading. For the second half, we're gonna meet up right here in about 40 minutes. 
and I'm going to show you a better way to deal with these sometimes difficult problems that involves building some new higher level abstractions on top of the features that are available in C++.